I am a why guy. I like to ask the why question about things. Hopefully not like that three-year-old constantly going, why, why, why? Or is that a two-year-old? I don't know. I've never had kids. But I, I, I pray that it's, it's an inquisitive mind. One of those questions that came up for me years ago was, why do we say that Jesus is God? Or rather, how do we know that Jesus is God? Because there are groups out there that don't believe this. The Jehovah's Witnesses, the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons uh, do not believe that Jesus is God, or at least they do not believe that Jesus is the God. In my previous sermon on this subject back in January, Is Jesus God?, I mentioned the New World Translation, which is Jehovah's Witness translation of the Bible that renders John 1.1 1, 1 as, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. As opposed to our rendering, which says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yeah. So some groups, groups often calling themselves Christian, don't believe that Jesus is God. There are some very famous people in history, we may not realize, did not believe in Jesus as God either. How many of you know who Thomas Jefferson is? Of course. Thomas Jefferson, he was asked many times what his beliefs were. And at one point in his life, later in his life, he put together what's referred to today as the Jefferson Bible. Have you ever heard the Jefferson Bible? I brought it up in Sunday school, so some of you have heard about this. The Jefferson Bible, and basically... What he did, he literally took two Bibles, King James translation, because that's what he had at the time, and he cut out what he liked, and he pasted it into another book, and he left what he didn't like in the Bible. And what you get is a Bible of sorts that completely takes out the divinity of Jesus. There is no virgin birth, there are no miracles, there is no resurrection. And what's really interesting is in an explanation that he makes for writing, or not for writing, but for compiling this, he wrote this letter and he says, quote, I too have made a wee little book from the same materials, the Gospels, which I call the philosophy of Jesus. It is a paradigm of his doctrines made by cutting the texts out of the book and arranging them on the pages of a blank book in a certain order of time or subject. A more beautiful or precious morsel of ethics I have never seen. Doesn't seem like a real humble guy sometimes. Anyway, it is a document in proof that I am a real Christian. All capital letters, by the way, real Christian. That is to say, a disciple of the doctrines of Jesus, very different from the Platonists who call me the infidel and themselves Christians and preachers of the gospel, while they draw all their characteristic dogmas from what its author never said nor saw. They have compounded from the heathen mysteries a system beyond the comprehension of man, of which the great reformer of the vicious ethics and deism of the Jews, were he to return to earth, would not recognize one feature. Interesting take on who Jesus is. So not everyone believes, even those that say they follow Christ. Based on that testimony, would you call the person that wrote that a Christian? I wouldn't. Which again brings up the question, how do we know that Jesus is God or is Jesus God? I got a question. I just want to... Yes. Yeah, I just want to tell Jesus and Lord, Jesus and God is the same character because your word Yes, Jesus is God, and that's yeah. exactly what I'm going to tell you here yeah. as we go through the message today. So, yeah. yeah, that's the answer. So, guys, if you want to go home, I guess you can, <laughs> you can head home. Jesus is God. Yeah. Amen. And part of answering this question, part of answering this question naturally lends itself to looking at the doctrine of the Trinity. We're going to talk about the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Today, that's one of the reasons I wanted to show you guys St. Patrick's bad analogies this morning. It's a, a ridiculous way of showing that, but they they hit it so well. They do it such such a good job with it um, that it's great. 
And we'll talk a little bit more deeply about all this in a little bit. The Trinity, not St. Patrick's bad analogies. But we're going to start today in John chapter 10, which is what was read for you just a moment ago. And we're not even so much going to look at what Jesus says here. But we're going to look at what his opponents say. Because to summarize this section here, they're questioning Jesus and they're saying, if you are the Messiah, tell us. Tell us if you're the Messiah. Do you remember how in so many of these parables that we've talked about, Jesus doesn't directly answer a question, right? It's, it's always a parable. It's always something else. And so in this situation, they say, tell us if you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, guys, I've told you what's going on. But when we look at it, it's not so much that Jesus has said specifically that he's the Messiah, but he said it with his actions, his works. The miracles that Jesus has performed show that he's the Messiah. And as a little aside here that I want to throw into this message, we talk so much about telling people about Jesus, spreading the message of Jesus, telling our friends, our family about the need to have Jesus in their lives. But here Jesus hasn't so much verbally said, I am the Messiah. What has he done? Shown it with his actions. We too need to show the goodness of Jesus in our actions, not just in telling people about how good Jesus is. It makes sense, doesn't it? We're supposed to go and do Christianity. I've said it before, let's make Christian a verb. Back into John. The people here haven't understood who Jesus is because they are not his followers, they are not his sheep, so they cannot understand. And then Jesus says, I and the Father are one. We're going to discuss this verse a little bit more in depth in a little while when I talk Trinity. But Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And after Jesus says this, we get a couple more verses. And I'm going to use a different translation here this morning. I'm going to use the English Standard Version because this actually does a little bit better job with one part of what Jesus or of what the, the opponents of Jesus says. So this is John 10, 31 through 33 in the English Standard Version. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. The New International Version there uses the phrase, claim to be God. But a better translation is, make yourself God. What's the difference here? Well, for one to claim that they are God is more of an internal thing. I can run around saying, I am God, but you're going to send me to Prairie St. John's for 72 hours, and they're going to treat me. Um, everybody's going to think that I'm, I'm losing it, right? But to make yourself God if you're not, is to demand others believe that you are and to treat you like a god. So the people that are there, the people that are ready to stone Jesus, they understand what Jesus is saying, that Jesus is God. This is why they're going to stone him, is because he's saying he is God. There is no question that Jesus, through his words and his actions, is saying that he is God. And this happens a couple of other places as well. John makes this abundantly clear throughout, uh, throughout his gospel. John 8, Jesus replied, For if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham? Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Jesus makes an incredible claim about who he is, and who his father is. The people rep recognize the implication of what Jesus says. He's saying that he's God, 
And what do they do? They pick up stones to stone him. Now, we're not talking like the, the landscaping rocks that we have out here. Okay, these are stones. These are big stones. Did you guys ever see Braveheart? The movie Braveheart? Okay, I should have got this clip, but I, I wasn't thinking about it. There's a scene in Braveheart where uh, William Wallace, Mel Gibson, comes back, and he's standing across from his childhood friend. And, you know, they beat, beat each other up quite a bit when they were kids, right? So he comes back, and his friend picks up a big stone, like this big, to throw at him. And he heaves it, and he completely misses him. Well, that's kind of the stones we're talking about. And then Wallace, being the smart guy, picks up a little rock and throws it and hits him in the head. But that's more of a... Well, anyway, we're talking big stones here. We're not talking landscaping stones. In John 5... So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father. What does it say? Making himself equal with God. So here are, here are just three examples of Jesus saying that he is, that he is God. There is no ambiguity in these statements. The people around him know what he is claiming. That's why they keep trying to kill him. They keep trying to kill him because in their eyes, Jesus, by saying he's God, by saying that he and the Father are one, Jesus is committing blasphemy. And what is the punishment for blasphemy? Blasphemy being stoned to death. Looking at this, it puts you in a place where you need to make a decision. Jesus says, I am God, period. No question, Jesus makes this claim. If what the Bible says is true, Jesus then says, I am God. Which tells us we need to decide between three things what we believe about Jesus. And I've said this once before. There are three options. The first option is that Jesus is not God. Jesus knew that he was not God, and therefore Jesus is a liar. The second option is that Jesus is not God. Jesus didn't know that he was not God, and therefore Jesus was delusional. He was mentally ill. Or our third option is Jesus is God. The question isn't, did Jesus say he was God? Jesus did. John 5, John 8, John 10. Jesus says he's God. That's why people sought to stone him, because of what he said. The question is, what do you believe about Jesus' claims to be God? Was he a liar? Was he mentally ill? Or is Jesus, in fact, God. John tells us right off the bat in his gospel that Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14 in the first chapter says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The Word was God. The Word became flesh. God came to earth in the flesh in the form of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus is God in his letter to the Philippians. In this section in, in, in the Philippians, he's talking about treating people right, treating others well. And he says uh, in verses 3 and 4, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. It's a reminder we need today, desperately. Treat others well. Why should we treat others well? Because Jesus did. Continuing on, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
Paul tells us, Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God. So even though Jesus was God, Jesus is God, and could have said to everybody, hey, I'm God. Treat me like God. You guys, come on, bring me grapes and stuff. I don't know. He was humble. He became a servant rather than being served. Jesus is God. Saying that Jesus is God brings up another question. How? How does this work? Jesus is God, but he refers to his Father in heaven, and the Father is God. And I do want to say this before we start talking about the Trinity today. You are not going to understand the Trinity. You are not going to understand the triune God. Don't think that you'll understand this. What we're going to do is try to find scripturally how we know that God is three in one, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But I'm just going to ask you to believe. Understandably, we try to figure this stuff out. We try to understand how all this stuff works. We live in the 21st century. We have this whole process kind of called the scientific method that has brought about incredible discoveries. Think of the things that we're aware of today that people 100 years ago, 250 years ago, 500 years, 2,000 years ago had no idea what was out there, couldn't have even imagined. The Hubble Space Telescope. You guys familiar with the Hubble Space Telescope? It has sent us some incredible images from around the universe that has sent back. 2,000 years ago, people couldn't have envisioned this was out there. How amazing is that? Think back in history to the American Civil War. More people died of disease than died in battle. Many died due to infected wounds as opposed to the wounds themselves. So much of that, if it would have happened in 2021, they would have lived. Modern medicine allows people to survive things today that would have killed them even 20 or 30 years ago. I'm not an oncologist, but I watch TV probably too much, and there's commercials out there for all kinds of treatments. And like I said, I'm not an expert in any of this, but it, it almost seems like with the new drugs and new treatments that are out there, my mom might still be with us today if she would have gotten cancer now as opposed to a decade ago. We see all these wonderful advances made and we think that we can figure everything out, including the mysteries of God. Are you familiar with Stephen Hawking, theoretical physicist, probably one of the most brilliant minds that has ever lived? He didn't believe in God. He stated very clearly that he didn't believe God existed. But my friends, physics, science in general, cannot disprove the existence of God. I also don't believe that science can prove the existence of God. It's where faith comes in. One of those amazing things about God is that we can know him personally through Christ Jesus. At the same time, we will never understand how God ticks. Will we? We'll never understand those mysteries of God. And perhaps the greatest mystery that's out there is this mystery of the Trinity. Now, if you grew up in church, much like being told that Jesus is God, you probably heard this triune God thing. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And much like the mysteries of space or the complexities of medicine, we try to understand and explain the reality of God. So we come up with these bad analogies like we watched earlier. God is like water that can exist as a solid and a liquid and a gas. The problem with this analogy is that water cannot exist as a solid and a liquid and a gas in the same time, in the same place. But God is 
the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all the time. Then we'll say you know, God is like a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You got, your, you got your peanut butter, you got your jelly, you got your bread, and it all combines together to make one sandwich, right? Well, God is not a sandwich. Simply adding three things together to make one other thing is not a way to explain our triune God. The Trinity is something we will not understand, no matter how much we may want to. We must accept that fact. But if we can't understand it, why should we believe it? If we can't understand it, why should we believe it? Well, my friends, it's because it's true. And the Bible tells us that it's true. Now, it may not be completely obvious as we read Scripture that God is, is three in one. Some of you may have seen this chart before, this visualization of what the Trinity might be. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father, but the Son is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Um, there's, there's good things and bad things. I use this just as a quick example, but if you take a really quick look at it, you can almost think that there's God in the center and then there's three minor gods around God, which is not true. Um, keep in mind that the Father is 100% God, the Son is 100% God, the Holy Spirit is 100% God. I know the math doesn't work for us as humans. 100 plus 100 plus 100 equals 100%. Does that, it doesn't really add up for it. Um, but just keep in mind, that's, that's an idea of that. But it does get a bit of a visual if you are a visual learner uh, as to how this relationship works. So how does the Bible tell us this? Well, in the last sermon uh, back in January when I did Is Jesus God, I talked a lot about John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. How can the Word be God and be with God at the same time? So it's starting to show us this relationship of how God the Son and God the Father interact with one another. And I went more in depth on that in my earlier sermon, so I'm not going to say any more with that one. But in our reading today, in John 10, we get another big hint of this triune nature of God. I and the Father are one. Now the first clue in this verse you can't see because it's in English up there. And I'm not going to put the Greek up there because I, that wouldn't do any of us any good at this point. So I'm just going to try to explain it to you. If you grew up speaking English, how many of you took a foreign language at some point in your life? Okay, awesome. Um, in English, how many of you are familiar with the word the? You guys have heard the word the, right? I've, I've said it I don't know how many times. Just humor me here for a second. So we have just one word for the definite article, the, right? I went to the store. Where is the bathroom? Can you help me find the library? I took a little bit of German in high school, and in German, there isn't just one word for the. In German, you have der, die, and das. And those of you that speak German, I'm going to keep it simple by just der, die, and das today. Der is the masculine definite article, die is the feminine, das is the neuter, or neutral. So back here in John, when, he, when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, this Greek is also gendered. Like the the in German is der, die, or das, or dane, or dame, and whatever. Um, one here is also gendered. And the word Jesus uses for one is not in the masculine form, it's in the neuter form. I'm getting to the point, just stay with me, okay? <laughs> Had he used the masculine form of the word one, it would suggest that Jesus and the Father are the same person. They are one and the same. Not, in, not separate in any way. The Father is the Son and the Son is the Father. So you look at the diagram, it says the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, right? If he had used that different form of the word one, it would suggest that Jesus and the Father are one in the same. But by using the, the neuter form here, Jesus is still saying that he and the Father are one, but they are not the same person. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, but he is saying that they are one, though they are not the same person, they are the, of the same 
essence, the same fundamental nature. Yet they are still different. The Son is God, but the Son is not the Father. The Father is God, but the, the Father is not the Son. Now, it, that doesn't make sense in our minds. I get it. It's complicated. You're probably even more confused than you ever were, and you're going to go home, and someone's going to say, well, what did Pastor talk about today? And I don't know something about Germany and neutering people, and I have no idea what he was talking about. Right? Let me try to simplify this for you a little bit more. Look at this verse. I and the Father are one. In that verse, the word are, is it singular or plural? It's plural. It's plural. If it was singular, Jesus would have said something along the lines of, uh, of I and the Father is one, or I and the Father am one. And it doesn't, it sounds weird to our ear, I know, but remember what Jesus said a couple chapters earlier. Before Abraham was born, I am Right? Not I was, but I am. Jesus says that he and the Father are one. There is a sameness there, but there is also a uniqueness between them. Even though there is one God, and they are each that one God, each of them 100% God, there is still a difference between them. None of us here is going to understand the Trinity. We're not going to understand how it, how God works. How can God be the hundred, Father be 100% God, Son be 100%, Holy Spirit be 100%? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't add up in our brains. But we need to see that the Bible, though it might not be completely obvious, the Bible does tell us that we have a triune God. One God in three forms, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Is Jesus God? Well, Jesus says he is. He tells us he's God. But you must decide whether or not you believe him. If Jesus is God, then we must accept this doctrine of the Trinity. Knowing full well we will never understand it, yet we must still believe it. How do you respond to Jesus saying that he is God? Will you cry, blasphemy, and pick up stones to stone him? Nope. Or will you, like Martha, say, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Amen.